Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, with one of the strongest economies in the nation, Oklahoma is enjoying a resurgence most states would be envious of. Today, we focus on our economy with the state's chief executive officer, Governor Mary Fallon. And in our Capital Insight, we look at a bill that could save some precious lives. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, Oklahoma's economy continues to grow, though at a much more subdued pace. Over the past year, state economic growth has averaged right at 2%, down substantially from the breakneck pace of 10% from the year before. Today, we sit down with Governor Mary Fallon to talk about her vision for the state and how we get there. But before we do, we asked the Department of Commerce's Deidre Myers to give us an Oklahoma Economy 101 Primer. Oklahoma has outperformed most other states, and particularly given the context of the global economy and the financial constraints of D.C., um, Oklahoma's performance has been very good. Uh, in 2012, we had 30,000 job gain, and we have been very strong, particularly in manufacturing. In fact, since Governor Fallon's administration began, we're ranked number two in job growth in manufacturing, which is very important because those wages are 30% higher than the average wage. And it also then supports innovation, research and development, uh, science, technology, engineering, which are high paying jobs. So the manufacturing foundation that we have in the state that is the basis of oil and gas, aerospace, um, agriculture, biosciences, transportation distribution um, is very strong and that's what has given Oklahoma an edge. Oklahoma has numerous strengths right now, which is uh, quite a blessing because there are many states that are struggling. We have five areas that are significant wealth drivers. The first is aerospace and defense. We have five military installations. We have very strong aerospace uh, manufacturing in terms of maintenance, repair, and overhaul that has been uh, very good. And it, it may have some bumps in 2013 because of the sequestration. We'll see how that goes, but since maintenance, repair, and overhaul is actually working on the fleet we already have, we may not be hit as badly as those areas that actually produce new planes. The second area is, of course, energy, uh, oil and gas, particularly natural gas, and then the variety of products that come from that. Third, agriculture and biosciences. Of course, everybody knows that we have very strong commodities in terms of, of production of grains and livestock, but we also have manufacturing around uh, agriculture and the biosciences, the, the sensors um, and other kinds of implements that are, are developed here in the state. Fourth, information and financial services. A lot of people don't know it, but the banking system in Oklahoma is extremely strong. Um, in fact, we were ranked fourth in the 2012 quarter in terms of uh, the best strength of our, our banking portfolios. And then lastly, transportation and distribution. Um, Oklahoma is in the middle of the country. We have uh, a wonderful transportation network that we continue to need to invest in. Uh, a lot of people don't know we have two ports the port of Catoosa and the port of Muskogee. So we have a lot of goods that are coming into Oklahoma that are then distributed throughout the Midwest and West. Well, economists typically watch revenue collections, otherwise known as taxes, as economic indicators. And while gross production taxes have taken a dip, primarily due to record low natural gas prices, consumption taxes, those taxes collected when we buy things, well, they're all up, which according to Myers, reflects rising household incomes. When we return, we visit with Governor Mary Fallon. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Governor Fallon, thank you so much for being here. Now, during your administration, we've seen unemployment lower to about 30%. We've seen all this job creation. What more can we do? 
Well, we can't let up. That's the big thing. And that's why I told the legislature in my state of the state that we have to keep the pedal to the metal. Now's not the time to let up. We're still facing a lot of challenges nationally with sequester and our, our national financial situation. So while we're doing good in Oklahoma, we're going to continue to focus on pro-growth job opportunities, focus on good legislation. Certainly education is the key to having a stronger, highly skilled, educated workforce. It's going to make a big difference in job retention, job creation, and attracting new industry to our state. Now I've heard you say multiple times one way to promote job growth is to cut business costs. And I know that you and the legislature are talking once again about workers' comp reform. I thought we did workers' comp reform last session. We did it two years ago. We passed a good workers' compensation reform bill, and it did make a difference. It actually did help lower the, the cost of, of medical costs, but we still have a long ways to go. And so we have an effort going out the Capitol this year and to truly and be able to make a huge difference in not only taking care of the injured worker, which is our number one goal, but to also help focus on creating a better bottom line for our businesses by having reasonable workers' compensation insurance premium costs, being able to look at the fraud and abuse within the system itself, looking at rising medical costs. Rising medical costs are a huge part of our workers' compensation costs itself. And even one of the other portions of my uh, program for this year is to look at prescription drug abuse and how can we lower prescription drug abuse, which can also affect on-the-job injuries. And that really has become an issue just in recent years, has it not? Well, drug abuse and, and prescription drug abuse in particular has been a problem that's plagued Oklahoma for a while, and we've done something about uh, meth labs in our state, but now it's prescription drugs that is um, causing us a lot of challenges in Oklahoma. So I laid out a plan during my State of the State speech to help fund more money towards mental health services, which will go to substance abuse treatment, also to emergency crisis centers, to what we call our systems of care within our health department, our mental health department, to determine where does a person need help? Is it a mental health issue? Is it a substance abuse issue? Is it um, something that's psychiatric? How can we better get that person the care that they need so that we reduce our health care costs, create a, a better, stronger, more productive workforce, and um, to address just our needs in Oklahoma. Let's talk a little bit about our state income tax. You've said you're committed to its gradual reduction. Let's contrast that to the, the very aggressive approach that our neighbors to the north took this past year, where they're actually now talking about some revenue gaps and they're having to fill that with a possible sales tax. You're taking a much slower approach. Well, we're taking a, a cautious approach in Oklahoma, but I do still believe and will continue to believe that you create a stronger, more vibrant economy, you create more jobs, and I absolutely know that it makes a difference in talking to businesses out of state what our income tax rate is. And of course, the goal is also to give more of our Oklahomans money in their own pocket, especially since the federal government's taking more money now with, with the recent tax increases they've had, but to allow businesses and people keep more of their hard-earned money because they circulate that back through the economy. And history has shown throughout Oklahoma when we've reduced our income tax that we've been able to grow revenue to pay for that the tax cut hit to our state budget that it more than pays for itself and generates even more revenue back into our economy. But like I said, when I talk to other businesses that may be looking at Oklahoma versus California or Illinois or New York or some of the other higher tax states, when they see that Oklahoma has a reasonable income tax rate, it makes us more attractive to be considered for either job expansion or for recruiting new businesses here. You look at California, they have huge budget shortfalls. They've had a lot of problems over the many, many years. Uh, they don't have the revenue they need uh, for their economy. They've raised their taxes, I think it's up to somewhere around 13% compared to our 5.25%. Kansas did lower their income tax rate down to 4.9%, and they're going to lower it even more gradually. Texas certainly has no income tax. And so we're in a, a very competitive marketplace, and I want to make sure Oklahoma can provide for essential governmental services, for education, for public safety, for health care, for the things that are important to Oklahomans, but yet have a reasonable tax rate. Do you ever worry, and I'm going to throw out an economic development term, that race to the bottom, that if we, we get to a point where 
we don't have enough revenue coming in. We may attract businesses into the state, but we may not have the infrastructure, whether that be roads or education, to keep them here. Well, absolutely. We have to think about our infrastructure in our state. We have to think about funding education. We have to think about funding our roads and our bridges in our state. Certainly, we're going to have more requirements under the, the new Affordable Health Care Act of things we have to do for health care in our state. We certainly have correction issues. We want to make sure our public is safe. So there are priorities in our state that are essential governmental services that we need to provide for our citizens and have the appropriate funding and revenue sources. But I believe that as you continue to fine tune and, and hone your your mixture of, of your whatever your tax level is versus um, your job creation, that that's going to help generate more revenue, as we have seen in the last two years. We've had some substantial growth in our rainy day savings account from going from having two dollars and three cents two years ago to now having six hundred million dollars in our savings account to having almost two hundred million dollars in our revenue growth just in the past fiscal year. So we've shown that as you gradually lower those taxes, make us more business friendly, that you can provide for essential services, have more money for things that you want to do, but you'd also give some money back to the people. Now, every time I hear you talk about the economy, you always mention the need to have a highly skilled and a highly educated workforce. How does education, whether it be common ed, higher ed, or career tech, how does that all figure in to meet industry's needs? We have to have a highly skilled, educated workforce to meet the needs of our workforce, especially when you have a low unemployment rate like Oklahoma does, 5.1%, which is the fourth lowest in the nation. Um, Stewart or Oklahoma, where I'm broadcasting from today, has a 3.7% unemployment rate, which is great. And that makes education even more important because you have to be able to meet the, the skills needed for the industries that we have in our state. And so we're working with our high schools, we're working with our career technology programs, we're working with higher education to make sure that we're focusing on what are the skill sets needed for our top industries. We call them our economic clusters, our, our wealth generation generation clusters so that we can raise the per capita income and raise the standard of living for our Oklahoma families. And so we've been working really hard on talking to our career technology centers, our, our colleges and universities, and making sure that we get people who complete whatever program they're going through, whether they're getting a certificate from a career technology center to do some, some certain type of profession, or whether they're going to college, that they stay in college, they complete college. And then the other side of the coin is making sure that once someone completes high school, that they're ready to learn or go into a career or go into a career technology area, that they're ready at the 12th grade to enter into whatever it is they're going to enter into education-wise. Now, you mentioned some very ambitious goals last year about trying to get more credentials and more degrees here in the state. What is it, 60, raising them by 67 percent by 2024? And people kind of gasp because that seemed like uh, a, a hard thing to do. How are we doing? We, we actually beat our goal. In fact, I'm very proud of our, our technology centers and our higher education institutions. We set a goal to increase the, the number, of grad, number of graduates, as you mentioned, either in certificates, associate degrees, or higher education four-year college degrees by 67 percent between now and the year 2022. And the reason we set that particular goal is that we know statistically by looking at trends in Oklahoma, looking at trends in our labor force in the nation, that we are going to need more than just a high school diploma to fill the type of job skill sets needed in the workforce itself whether it's getting a career certificate or whether it's getting an associate or a college degree, we know that 80 percent of our jobs in the future are going to require something more than just a basic high school degree. And so that's why we set that goal. We were able to beat the goal the first year. Now the challenge is we have to continue to ramp up those numbers and then we'll be prepared to have a, a stronger economy by having the skilled workforce that we need. Now, speaking of the economy, you know, we, we talk so much about the importance of the oil and gas industry, but those prices have been down. But I think it speaks to the, the overall strength of our economy that while oil and gas prices have been a little bit lower this past year, uh, the economy is still fairly strong. The economy is still doing strong, and, and natural gas prices have been down, mainly because we've become so good at being able to produce 
uh, natural gas and oil through horizontal drilling and, and hydraulic fracturing, that we've been able to produce more uh, throughout the whole nation. And so that's been good for our nation because my hope is that we'll lead our nation to energy independence so that we don't send our money from America over to foreign countries, that we keep it here in America. We create American jobs, American energy, which I think is important for our national security and our economic security. But it's certainly good for Oklahoma because we're creating an Oklahoma market for natural gas. And actually 22 states have now joined in our effort on our CNG a conversion of state cars and trucks over to compressed natural gas, and, and we think it's going to be good for our whole nation. Let's talk a little bit more about state government. I know there's $11 billion in unfunded liabilities when it comes to the employee state pension fund. And I know you didn't dig the hole, you know, and I don't want to cast any blame here, but kind of looking to you to fill it. How do we get it done? Absolutely. Well, that's a very big drag on Oklahoma is having unfunded liabilities and pension systems in many, many states. In fact, I don't know, maybe all states have pension problems and companies have pension problems too. But one of the things we tried to do is reduce our unfunded liability through pension reforms. And we did pass some great pension reform in 2011 during the legislative session. We had a $16 billion unfunded liability in our pension systems. We've been able to drop that down to $11 billion, which is a huge amount of drop for that, but it's still not good enough. We have to do more to make sure that our pension systems are stable, that they're gonna be there in the future for our firefighters, our police officers, our state employees, our teachers, all those who are part of our state pension system. So I have some good ideas and once again saving some money and financially securing our pension systems. And not only is it important for those who are going to be retiring at some point in time, but it's also important for Oklahoma when it comes to our, our bonds and the interest rate that we are given when, when we have bonds that are let, whether it's through local municipalities or through its whether it's through the state itself, we get lower interest rates if we're more financially stable. And so that's another reason why we need to continue to do pension reform. And I'm looking forward to the legislature sending me some of the proposals back so I can sign them <laughs> into law. But we've, we've made some great progress, but we still have more room to go. Let's move on to mental health. I, after you presented your executive budget, I was talking to a police chief, one that I have a great deal of respect for, and he said the increase in funding in mental health is probably one of the best things that could be done for local law enforcement because that's where they spend much of their time. Absolutely. Well, we've had some challenges with our mental health funding in the state of Oklahoma, so I put some money in there last year. I put a big portion in there again this year because we're gonna focus on trying to get people the help they need so that they don't end up in our correctional facilities, end up in our mental institutions or those that are hooked on some type of substance abuse don't um, have problems in their personal lives. You know, it, it weighs upon our society. It, uh, you know, substance abuse issues can affect our poverty levels. It certainly affects those that are incarcerated in prison. I see probably 80 to 85 percent of the, the pardon paroles that come through the system have some type of drug-related conviction associated with whatever the crime might have been that they uh, perpetrated and ended up in our correctional facilities. There are just those who just suffer with addiction issues, especially prescription drug addiction issues, which is on the rise in our state. So we need to put the resources to helping people with substance abuse treatment, our systems of care, which are in our communities to be able to determine where does a person need help and also to, to help with our, our psychiatric issues in our state. If someone could get some medicine that they need to help them with say bipolar disease or something like that, help them get back on their feet to become a productive citizen, that's good for Oklahoma. Madam Governor, thank you so much. Thank you, you always do a good job, Rob. I appreciate it. Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. Well, congenital heart defects are the number one killer in infants with birth defects, which is why state lawmakers are considering legislation that would require a more effective heart screening of newborns before they ever leave the hospital. Representative Dan Kirby is the bill's author. This bill is a inexpensive, non-invasive, simple test that hospitals normally do anyway to test to make sure the uh, level of oxygen in babies are normal. It catches heart defects at an early, early uh, age in a baby's life. In this week's Capital Insight, we learn how one couple's personal tragedy led to legislation that could save lives 
and taxpayer dollars. Grayson was born on uh, March 1st of 2011. We brought him home on uh, March 3rd. You know, just to have the whole family together under one roof was, uh, was great. This is my buddy, Bo. <laughs> and I like to hold him all night. We took him back to the hospital for a weight check because it was the weekend. You know, it's one of those things, he, he, something felt wrong, but we, uh, He'd he felt cold. Himself. He'd felt cold for yeah. about a day. By the time we got to the hospital, it, his temperature was 91.7. So they rushed us down to the ER. It was over five hours in our local ER before he was um, flown to Oklahoma City. I was holding his little hand, and I, I told him, just hold on until we get there. Uh, and he squeezed my finger. And I thought right then that he was going to he was gonna fight as hard as he could. He did. He was a fighter. It's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, essentially, the left half of his heart, uh, there was muscle there, but it hadn't formed into a chamber. Right? And so that's what pumps blood out to your body he didn't have that part and so what that means is on that day when he very nearly died um, by some accounts some of his organs did and so they had to be brought back uh, we spent a month in the hospital just trying to get his his lungs his kidney his liver uh, to get all those back in good enough shape that then we could go forward and treat the heart condition and also during the first few days there before he was diagnosed yeah. there was so much more damage done to what half the half of the heart he did have. Yeah, it was having to work so hard that it was. I mean, it was scarred. That up, caused pro problems later on. Yeah. The pulse ox screening uh, will detect, in most cases, the seven critical congenital heart defects, um, of which HLHS is one of the most severe. Um, it doesn't catch all of them, but the rate's right around the upper 80s to the 90 percent of, of how many cases it will find. You know, from our standpoint, if Grayson had had this test, uh, there's no helicopter ride, there's no near-death experience, it's we discover it in the hospital, we take it, transport him to the specialist in Oklahoma City, probably by an ambulance, or we can go with him, and before he's ever in a, a, a bad, bad way, he's on the medicine that keeps the rest of his organs, the rest of his body strong and healthy but he also would have had his first surgery that week instead of waiting three and a half weeks to have it. You know, there's, there's plan A, there's plan B, there's plan C, and what happened with us was plan A went out the window because of what happened that, that fifth day. Uh, one open heart, and um, I, I've lost count of how many cath, cath procedures. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the last procedure, um, his heart just gave out, and it, it stopped for a while. Um, and in the end, he was out too long, and um, it's called hypoxic brain injury. And um, he, you know, he came back to the room, but he didn't come back. I went to high school with uh, very kindly sent him some balloons. That little boy loved those balloons. Uh, he'd, he'd grab hold of the string and play with them and pop them. And at the funeral, we had some friends um, give us some balloons, uh, a, a lot of them, and uh, we released them. So it, it was very nice. I hope, you know, the next kid who has a similar problem, it, it's found early enough to give them better options. There are three of us heart moms working with the State Department of Health, so we'll get it right. Absolutely. Well, 
Well, the cost of a pulse ox screening ranges between five to ten dollars still. Some physicians will only do the test if they suspect a heart defect, which in the case of the Moore family and others led to tragic results. Now to learn more about this test, visit graysonsadvocates.org, which we have a link to on our website. A high school diploma just isn't what it used to be. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at the work underway to create a workforce for today's jobs. 30% of the new jobs in these areas in Oklahoma will require a bachelor's or a higher degree. A full 50% will require an associate's degree or a very critical industry certificate. Those are generally through career tech. And Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that is going to wrap us up for today, but you can see more of any of our stories on our website at OKHorizon.com. You can watch us on the go with our weekly podcast on iTunes, follow us throughout the week on Twitter at OKHorizonTV, or just become a Horizon fan on Facebook. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next time. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.